there is arguably no historical figure buried under as much propaganda, mystification and outright historical falsification as Stalin. Likewise, there is no historical epoch apart from Stalin's Soviet Union that has been so distorted that it is now utterly unrecognizable from how it really was. Up to this day, Stalin is known mainly from Cold War caricatures propagated by the CIA and its accomplices. Stalin first saw this reality when he said that rubbish would pile on his grave. But Stalin also recognized that the winds of history would sweep it away without mercy. With the winds of history blowing from the east, let us look at Stalin as he really was. Cold War mythology depicted the Soviet Union as a bureaucratic, totalitarian state with an omnipotent Stalin running every minute detail of people's lives. However, this fantastical imagery contradicts all historical facts and basic common sense. To see how and why, let us begin with what is considered the origins of Stalin's Soviet Union, the events immediately following the collectivization. While the entire Western world was dealing with the aftermath of the Great Depression, the Soviet Union was marching forward, vindicating its model despite the chaos in the West. Collectivization had finally put to rest periodic agricultural crises and famines, laid basis for rapid industrialization, rekindled the people's revolutionary spirit and, as a result, had immensely strengthened Soviet power. However, while collectivization itself required heavy-handed measures, Stalin sought to curb the power of local bureaucrats, democratize the country and empower the people immediately following the collectivization. Actions that were, in fact, continuation of what was already attempted in the late 1920s. This period was also marked by Stalin's vicious criticism of the bureaucracy. But one of the most serious obstacles, if not the most serious of all, is the bureaucracy of our apparatus. I'm referring to the bureaucratic elements to be found in our party, government, trade union, cooperative and all other organizations. I'm referring to the bureaucratic elements who batten on our weaknesses and errors, who fear like plague all criticism by the masses, all control by the masses, and who hinder us in developing self-criticism and ridding ourselves of our weaknesses and errors. Not even high-ranking officials were free from that critique. When those officials pleaded to Stalin personally to rein in and fear newspaper criticism of leading officials, he objected and responded by saying, I consider your proposal risky in that it could objectively lead to curbing of self-criticism, which is unacceptable. Full-on self-criticism activates the masses and creates a stage of siege for all and all kinds of bureaucrats. This is a great achievement. That critical spirit was not only carried into the 30s, but magnified tenfold. For example, the leading Soviet newspaper, Pravda, was full of bureaucratic criticism and also insisted that people engage in it. Only an enemy is interested in saying that we, the Bolsheviks, do not notice actual reality. Only an enemy strives to put the rose-colored glasses of self-satisfaction over the eyes of our people. Criticism could be found and was encouraged at all levels of society. The party leadership implored people to write their critique to newspapers, workers were encouraged to criticize managers and directors at the workplace, party members were encouraged to critique their nominal superiors, and even consumers had an institutionalized medium to report their grievances. Every foreigner visiting the Soviet Union at that time reported this unprecedented democratic spirit at play. One account stated that, Nowhere in the world outside the USSR is there such a continuous volume of pitiless criticism of every branch of government, every industrial enterprise, and every cultural establishment. This perpetual campaign of exposure, which finds expression in every public utterance of the leading statesmen, in every issue of the press, and in every trade union and corporate meeting, is not only officially tolerated, but also deliberately instigated as a powerful incentive to improvement alike in direction and in execution. While one factory director claimed such criticism was an ordeal to him that he tried to avoid, he admitted that any director who suppressed criticism would be severely punished. He would not only be removed, he would be tried. Communist party rank and file members and non-party workers alike were cool to discuss and check the actions and decisions taken by the party bureaucrats. For that purpose, Stalin also initiated the so-called cleansing campaign, where every single member of the Communist Party was subjected to rigorous examination in front of an audience. 
Members were subjected to questions regarding their life history and daily activities, and those deemed unfit, too passive or incompetent were promptly removed from the party. Even consumers had avenues to criticize shopkeepers. For instance, each Soviet store had a notebook in which customers would write complaints or suggestions. The store's management was compelled by law to respond in writing to criticism and indicate what concrete measures would be taken to address them. Additionally, the early 1930s marked Stalin's other efforts at profound democratization. Old intelligentsia were rehabilitated, literally to relation was being preached, large numbers of prisoners were released from labor camps and prisons, former oppositionists were rehabilitated, kulaks were given rights, the secret police was reformed and its power curbed significantly, while local bureaucrats were being forced to give up all use of terroristic action against the supposed enemies of the people. Instead, party leadership insisted upon education and political work among the masses. Demands for mass expulsion from the countryside and for the use of harsh forms of repression continued to come in from a number of provinces. It looks as if these comrades are willing to replace and are already replacing the political work conducted among the masses with administrative checkist operations of organs of the GPU and regular police. Any calls to renew those so-called mass operations were explicitly linked to enemy theory. Instead, party leadership initiated a thoroughgoing legal reform intended to lay the basis for an impartial modern legal system with reliable courts and respect for laws. For that purpose, a union-wide procuracy was established for the first time in 1934. The inevitable result of these reforms was the drastic reduction of arrests throughout the early 30s, with most arrests being for thievery, hooliganism and the like. Not to mention the fact that at that time, far from being merely punitive, the Soviet penal system prided itself on being rehabilitative, trying to reforge common criminals and former class enemies through various corrective initiatives. Furthermore, Stalin was also trying to enact a separation between the party and the state, which was increasingly being muddled. He tried to remove the party from any day-to-day -day activities and relegate the party's task to those of agitation, propaganda and participation in the selection of cadres. In other words, the party would be there to win the masses over to the cause of communism through political and moral leadership and not to run the state through Kashyyyk bureaucratic positions, which inevitably corrupted the party spirit. In light of this, it should be clear that being a bureaucrat or even a party member at this time didn't mean being comfortable in one's power over and against the masses. To an extent that was true, Stalin both as a person and as a symbol, not only did not sanctify such state of affairs, but precisely came at the expense of such status quo. Instead of being an embodiment of Soviet bureaucracy at the expense of the people, Stalin was explicitly and unambiguously signifying people's power against the power of corruption of bureaucrats. All of Stalin's efforts at democratizing the Soviet Union culminated in the so-called Stalin Constitution of 1936. Initiated in 1935, the Stalin Constitution was supposed to be, and was, the most democratic constitution in the world. Above and beyond guaranteeing citizens' rights and democratic election to all bodies of power, it also guaranteed satisfaction of the concrete material needs of the people. As opposed to Western constitutions, which were aspirational in nature, the Stalin Constitution was meant to be practical historical document. The Constitution's necessity stemmed from the significant social and political changes that came from the successful collectivization and implementation of the first five-year plan, which made the 1924 Constitution outdated. However, as one of non-Marxist historian notes, at the same time though, a genuine extension of popular participation was a primary motivation. Stalin and his closest party leaders were personally invested in and responsible for leading the constitution's writing process. They carefully analyzed western constitutions and presupposed their achievements. And while following the Cold War propaganda, it is customary to dismiss the Stalin constitution and all of Stalin's efforts towards democratization as a ruse and a sham, non-Marxist historians working with the most recently available archival material cannot find any evidence to suggest that Stalin and the party leadership did not take this seriously. 
They were adamant about implementing the constitution and its norms, both in public and in private, even if it meant standing against most of the party bureaucracy and parts of the population itself. Above all else, the Stalin constitution guaranteed universal, direct and free elections, which Stalin saw as the most powerful tool for the people to combat bureaucratism, corruption and arbitrariness. As one anti-Stalin historian notes, Several keynote speakers, including Stalin and Zhdanov, Secretary of the Central Committee and the Leningrad Regional and City Committees, stressed the need for multi-candidate secret ballot elections for posts within the party, the Soviets and the unions. They sharply criticized the political culture that had grown increasingly ossified and bureaucratic, stressing the need to reinvigorate governing institutions from below. The plenum, which would provide the future marching orders for the party, thus opened the door to a whirlwind of mass mobilization. Furthermore, the constitution was supposed to help solve one of the most significant issues facing the Soviet Union the independence and license of local elites, which were usually built around so-called family circles of closely knit groups and were abusing their power by expelling the rank and file opposition from the party. Instead of being a completely centralized totalitarian state, the Soviet Union, both in the 30s and after, faced an enormous challenge of independence and unaccountability of local elites, which prevented the state from functioning in an efficient and democratic way. For instance, while regional party organizations were supposed to hold annual elections, the majority of them were not. And when they did, the results were predetermined by the very same elite that was to be challenged in those elections. Elites ignoring, diverting and modifying central directives, food dragging and even outright sabotage of Moscow's efforts were realities that Stalin faced. That issue had become most acute in the context of elections guaranteed by the constitution. It was something that most of the bureaucracy, especially its upper echelons, rejected in no uncertain terms. For instance, when Zhdanov gave the main report on the elections at the Central Committee plenum and called for the democratization of the entire party, the conclusion of his speech was marked by complete silence from party members. In light of the customary practices of Central Committee meetings, this was simply unprecedented. On another occasion, party secretaries piled so much criticism towards the proposal that the meeting chair had to intervene. Every time the proposal had to be discussed, party bureaucrats expressed their disdain in one way or another, usually by fearmongering about giving voice to the enemies of the people or fearing for their own careers. Even the campaign to discuss the constitution among the population was something that officials had to be forced to do. Time and time again, central leaders had communicated their dissatisfaction with the process. Many Soviet and executive committees are badly helping, are not promoting nationwide discussion, are not organizing the recording and generalization of suggestions and amendments. This situation is intolerable. Chairman of Soviets and his polkoms are obliged to ensure a genuine discussion of the draft constitution by all citizens. However, with ceaseless insistence by Moscow, the discussion ended up being an immense achievement. 50 million people participated and made over 40,000 suggestions to the constitution. Those discussions and suggestions, which even anti-Soviet historians had to admit were wide and open in terms of the critiques tolerated, demonstrate to us the desires and aspirations of the Soviet people beyond Western propaganda. As the most recent book on the matter put it, at no point in these discussions can we find any trace of Western liberalism. Although citizens were concerned with bread and butter issues and popular control of local affairs, they were not worried about individual rights or civil protection. Workers and peasants, who were not party members, displayed a distinctly and liberal attitude on personal freedom. More specifically, the Soviet people most adamantly rejected two constitutional principles, allowing former disenfranchised enemies of the people to vote and the legal principle of habeas corpus, that is, serving justice only through the legal system. With regards to the latter, their comments represent a traditional, down-to-earth, no-nonsense, setting things straight attitude towards crime and an intolerance with the procedural niceties of regularized justice. Many could see no reason to wait for an office procurator's approval before arresting and punishing malfactors. Despite that, Stalin insisted on those principles and refused to alter the constitution in that direction. 
party bureaucracy, especially party secretaries, however, insisted on the rejection of elections. After being forced to organize the discussions, they then had to be prodded, downbeaten and threatened to organize the elections they disdained. Their skepticism and dissatisfaction very soon turned into outright sabotage. In light of that, about 15,000 party officials were removed from their positions and some of them were even tried for sabotaging the process. However, the multi-candidate election in trade union and local party and state organizations did end up happening in 1937. About a half of local officials were voted out in a free, secret election. Higher officials were increasingly adamant about the potential dangers of the upcoming election to the Supreme Soviet, citing example after example of former kulaks and other anti-Soviet elements gaining power and explicitly using it to undermine the Soviet state, they started to plead for so-called mass operations against the enemies of the people. Stalin, however, was unrelenting. They say that this is dangerous, that enemy elements such as white guards, kulaks, priests and so forth can sneak into the higher organs of Soviet power. But what are they actually afraid of? If they are afraid of wolves, don't go into the forest. If the people do elect dangerous elements, then it would be a sign that our agitation work went badly and we could fully deserve that disgrace. Some comrades say that it is not advisable to speak openly of one's mistakes, since the open admission of one's mistakes may be construed by our enemies as weaknesses and may be used by them. This is rubbish, comrades, downright rubbish. The open recognition of our mistakes and their honest rectification can, on the contrary, only strengthen our party, raise its authority in the eyes of the workers, peasants and working intellectuals. And this is the main thing. As long as we have the workers, peasants and working intellectuals with us, all the rest will settle itself. In line with those democratic reforms, the Soviet Union was also unique in democratizing culture itself, fully embracing women's liberation, rejecting colonialism and any form of racism, even in its quasi-scientific and respectable eugenics guise, was a principal matter of state policy and ideology. Conversely, many Western countries had either embraced or entertained eugenics and scientific racism. Speaking of all these processes in the 1930s, even such anti-Soviet historians as Stephen Kotkin could not deny the world historic significance of these reforms. Not only could the USSR and the Stalin plausibly claim that it had developed the program and practices of state-guaranteed social welfare to a greater extent than had previously been the case anywhere, but it could do so in a way that contrasted with the fascist traction, by embracing fully the illustrious European heritage known as the Enlightenment. However, as examples of actual threats started piling up, when NKVD also changed its mind and started insisting against democratization, and when party secretaries started outright demanding the organization of mass operations, Stalin gave in. July 1937 marked the beginnings of what came to be known as the Great Purge. Initially targeted at the enemies of the people identified by the party leaders, the terror was soon turned inwards and targeted the very same bureaucracy that resisted the democratization. It became a populist event, a culmination of the struggle between Stalin and local party elites. But it also showed very tangible problems that the Soviet Union faced unrelenting anti-Soviet forces on the ground, largely liberal, self-interested peasant masses and unaccountable corrupt bureaucrats. Together with preparations for their upcoming war, those events put any effort at the democratization of the Soviet Union on hold. However, even beyond that, the war itself ended up fundamentally transforming the Soviet Union. In the context of the contingencies of the war and the absolute necessity to win it, the most immediate measure of efficiency trumped everything else. Whether you could produce military equipment as fast as possible using any means necessary was more important than how good and honest communist you were. Stalin simply had no choice but to recognize that for the duration of the war at least, the country would be run by local leaders with little to no oversight from Moscow. This allowed the Soviet Union to claim the victory of world historic significance and save the world from the Nazi disease, but the price the Soviet Union had to pay was simply immeasurable. 
all the work of the 30s to curb the independence and unaccountability of the bureaucracy and democratize the Soviet Union was wiped out. Then, with the war ending, not only were local elites stronger than ever, but the entire pre-war communist party was destroyed. More than half of the party joined the Red Army and perished in the war. The most militant non-party population, the first to join the Red Army, also perished. Much like the civil war in 1918 wiped out the proletariat, which formed the social basis for Bolshevik power, the Second World War wiped out the most militant supporters of Stalin and his efforts to democratize the country. While in the pre-war period the Communist Party was dominated by workers and peasants, with white-color workers comprising only a minority of the party, after the war the latter became a majority. Worse yet, most of the new party members had little to no familiarity with the intricacies of Marxist theory. Stalin and his leadership recognized this early on. In order to fight those developments, they initiated the so-called Zhdanov Doctrine, which was supposed to reinvigorate the spirit of Marxism-Leninism at the expense of technocratic and Americanizing tendencies then present and powerful. New party members were not vetted, and after being admitted to the party they had no guidance. Individual work was being substituted by one-size-fits-all technocratic and coercive approaches, and ideological and political work among the masses was completely ignored. In light of this, all sorts of means were used to try to force party bureaucrats into submitting to the spirit of party discipline and into educating themselves in politics, political economy, Marxist theory, as well as in so-called practical matters. Reportedly, Stalin's leadership even prepared a new draft party program in 1947, which announced democratization as an explicit and immediate task. To quote from it, The development of socialist democracy on the basis of the completion of the construction of a classless socialist society will increasingly convert the dictatorship of the proletariat into the dictatorship of the Soviet people as each member of the whole population is gradually drawn into day-to-day -day management of state affairs, the growth of the population's communist consciousness and culture and the development of socialist democracy will lead to the progressive dying out of forms of compulsion in the dictatorship of the Soviet people and to a progressive replacement of measures of compulsion by influence of public opinion to a progressive narrowing of the political functions of the state and to the conversion of the state into, in the main, an organ of the management of the economic life of society. This is how an anti-Stalin Russian historian familiar with this document summarized it. In particular, the draft concerned the development of the democratization of the Soviet order. This plan recognized as essential a universal process of drawing workers into the running of the state, into daily active state and social activity on the basis of a steady development of the cultural level of the masses and a maximal simplification of the functions of state management. It proposed in practice to proceed to the unification of productive work with participation in the management of state affairs, with the transition to the successive carrying out of the state functions of state management by all working people. It also expatiated upon the idea of the introduction of direct legislative activity by the people. Nor was the principle of election of management ignored. For this, the maximum possible development of independent voluntary organizations were seen as important. However, it was finally recognized in 1948 that the efforts towards invigoration and democratization were not leading anywhere. With post-war reconstruction being the utmost priority and with a profound lack of competent managers to freely choose from, those efforts were largely ignored or outright dismissed by the party bureaucracy, which was now largely shaped by the experiences of war, where the goal of industrial efficiency trumped all others, and who were inculcated in the values of unquestioned loyalty to direct supervisors. Many of the new post-war bureaucrats even lacked basic knowledge of the party history, understanding of politics, and even the most basic skills of bureaucratic maintenance, bookkeeping, and stenography. Even the population, ever so eager to respond to calls to denounce their superiors before the war, were less willing to critique them now. As such, Stalin had to make a temporary truce with technocratic tendencies in the party. The truce was about to end just before Stalin's death, when he was already organizing a new purge of the party. We cannot know for certain how it would have developed, 
but we do know for sure that the primary target of the purge was the old guard of the party, the same old guard that would end up establishing the gerontocracy, forming the basis of nomenclature and ultimately leading to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And if Stalin's last major work, Economic Problems in the USSR, is any guide, Stalin was ready to fundamentally reform the Soviet economy in a way not dissimilar to that of Deng's reforms in China. Unfortunately, the purge was cut short by Stalin's death, and the bureaucracy ended up denouncing Stalin, occluding the reality of the masses outside of state bureaucracy, and hence consolidating its grip on power. All those historical facts fly in the face of those historical falsifiers who take the Soviet Union to be a so-called totalitarian state with Stalin as an all-powerful leader over the people. But even beyond that, they do not understand that the Soviet state, and especially the Communist Party, were incredibly understaffed and lacked proper communication networks with regards to the actual and most basic tasks they had to fulfill. The majority of the country, especially the rural areas, either lacked Communist Party presence or didn't have it in sufficient numbers, especially after the war, when even the meager pre-war party presence in the countryside was destroyed. In that respect, Stalin was always fighting an uphill battle as far as his efforts to democratize the Soviet Union were concerned. And with regards to Stalin's so-called authoritarianism, its primary target was not the people, but precisely the bureaucracy that often came at the people's expense. It is for that reason, as we have shown, that when they were encouraged to speak up directly to state representatives about their desires, the people's complaints were not an encroachment by the state upon individual or collective liberties, but precisely the opposite, a lack of sufficiently strong state with enough presence in the country. But beyond historical interest, what lessons for today can we draw from Stalin and his efforts at democratization of the Soviet Union? One thing that Stalin took as his mortal sin, and that most leftists even today fail to understand, is one-sidedness. For instance, Stalin recognized that every democratization and decentralization at one level must be contemporaneous with centralization at another level, and vice versa. It is for that reason that not only is there no contradiction between people's power at the grassroots level and Stalin's centralization of power at the expense of the bureaucracy, but they actually condition one another. It is for the same reason that Chinese people were most empowered and showed the most sustained effort at democratization during the heights of Mao's cult of personality, where they used that cult to beat corrupt bureaucracy into submission. One-sided decentralization that is so popular among the so-called libertarians mean nothing more than submission to the status quo of local establishments or to the blind impersonal forces of capital and unaccountable deep state. After all, the state, the central power, is not an appendage to reality, but itself represents something objective in their reality and beyond itself. Likewise, exactly the same can be said of one-sided centralization that is so common among most dogmatic Marxist-Leninists, who see any form of decentralization as a corruption of the beauty of the veneer of centralization. Dogmatic, formal understanding of centralization, which fails to understand its dialectic with necessary dynamism and decentralization at another level, must necessarily end up in ignorance of objectivity that comes at the expense of any calcification of the state. It is for that reason that both Khrushchev's decentralizing and Americanizing tendencies are just another side of Brezhnev's centralizing and russifying tendencies. Both represented the calcification of the power of the elites at the expense of the people. The name of Stalin signifies the difficult but the only correct road to socialism between such deviations of one-sidedness. Where others lay empty one-sided solutions for all times and for all places, Stalin signifies the openness of the meaning and form of socialism, as well as the actual hard work of relating to concrete circumstances through concrete means. For this reason, he comes at the expense of any calcification of the here and now. This is why Stalin was so despised and feared by Soviet bureaucrats. They knew that as long as Stalin was alive, his threatening gaze would never let them feel comfortable, but would forever be forcing them to submit to the people. 
whereas others try to lure the people away from their power and liberation. By the temporal respite of discipline, Stalin signifies the hard Marxist truth that freedom and liberation are nothing else than insight into necessity. Stalin signifies the only true center of the people, and for this, even up to this day, he is fondly remembered by millions and millions of people around the world as their hero.